My topic now is the management of upper extremity critical limb ischemia. Again, I think I've been singled out for all the rare things possible on the planet, but we do see a significant amount of upper extremity ischemia. Uh, acknowledgements to the previous three lecturers for the last three years for the slides, but I've completely changed them. So my apologies to those. So we have um, epidemiology, we'll talk about a little pathology, we'll talk about etiology, common and rare. Uh, history and ex physical exam, diagnostic studies and treatment. And the, every, every spectrum of presentation has a little bit different ap approach to treatment. And then there are some rare and sexy conditions we will come to in the end as well. So it's less common than the lower extremity. You know, you see on the OR board a cold leg more than a cold hand most of the time, right? And because there is a rich collateral network that sits around the scapula that provides, that provides uh, support or blood flow to the arm, once the inflow vessel is diseased. So that's why your arm is still not that symptomatic, unless it's something really bad and, and really big or really chronic. So there's usually a small vessel disease involving palmar and digital arteries. That's what we see commonly because people come with gangrenous fingers. Usually they have signals at least going down to those arteries. So you think the palmar arch has signals, radial and ulnar artery has signals, but the digits are still ischemic, likely because of small vessel disease. And then larger vessel occlusive disease is rare. But yes, we do see a fair share of them. Um, affects younger persons more than older when it's symptomatic. So the etiology is this simple list made complex by the sublists. But essentially, it's a lot of things can cause it, right? From vasospasm to intrinsic arterial disease to inflammatory disease in the vessel, aneurysmal disease, trauma, which we see more in level one trauma centers. Ours is not, thankfully. <clears throat> So we don't see that, but uh, it's a good mix to see and, 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 and treat. And then medical conditions for digital arteries are you know, thrombophiliac stage, the polycythemia, these are all the small vessel disease you cannot do much about, at least surgically or intervention-wise. Uh, common intervent commonly we see is we see, in our institution, we see steel syndrome, like falling through the roof. You want to close the door, but they just ram it open. Anyway, so because we do a lot of dialysis access, so we see a lot of them. And places which do dialysis access will have their fair share of steel syndrome. Then drug-induced vasospasm, thromboembolic events, which is 20% of all embolic events, 30% uh, of all other arterial. Uh, Raynaud's disease phenomenon, and then non-obstructive versus obstructive disease. The less common ones are like the small vessel occlusion that you can treat, of course. Um, autoimmune disease, scleroderma, crest, uh, SLE, the arteriosclerosis, where the arterial wall is hardened, the vasculitis, the Burgers disease, and then the traumatic and environmental factors. Uh, vasospastic disease, which is Raynaud's with two apostrophes. Sorry, I did not make that typo. But um, I don't know. A black and white picture never does justice to ischemia, which I put it there because uh, we have to find a better picture of Raynaud's. There is a nurse we have. She has Raynaud's. So I'm going to focus on her hands next time I meet her. <laughs> So <laughs> acute, so history and physical, acute and chronic, predisposing factors. I don't know, it wasn't that funny, but anyway. Uh, palpation, so we always palpate both normal and abnormal extremity. I keep, I reminded myself when I was in training, do not miss the normal side, and I keep telling my trainees, don't miss the normal side. Because sometimes a comparative exam is probably the same. You don't have an ulnar pulse here, but they don't have an ulnar pulse on the other side, and that's probably normal for them. So think about, think about the normal and the abnormal. Look at obvious discoloration, look at obvious ulceration, look at the neurologic function, because that's what obviously happens first, is neurologic symptoms before you start seeing uh, arterial or venous symptoms. Uh, signs related to previous procedures, like AV access on the arm, or you have catheterization of some kind, or they have a radial access for a cath, or they've had an arterial line in the ICU, those kind of things. Uh, diagnostic studies, the classic studies, we do arm pressures bilaterally, waveforms on the fingertips, and then um, we do segmental pressures, of course, uh, and then duplex ultrasound. Duplex ultrasound mainly for surveillance, but also for diagnosis for, you know, the spectral widening or the velo or, and the velocities in the vessels, too. A CT angiogram for upper extremity is usually limited for the inflow disease, like the thoracic outlet or the proximal arteries, not so much for the distal arteries, because Usually, I think, I think arteriograms and duplexes will give you a far more superior diagnosis than a CT angio. Plus, it's also hard to do because the hand has to be above the head and then they go through the donut. So it, it's, kind of, it's a little uh, technically challenging CT angio to perform. Uh, 
Um, the anatomy is very simple. There are 34 labels there which should be memorized by the end of this talk. But essentially, it's, it's um, th the main thing to remember after this mouse comes up is that our disease here at the proximal, exp at, at the proximal um, area is usually not that symptomatic. That's the weird part. The more proximal you go in the arterial system in the upper extremity, the more collateral flow there is to supply the arm. So the disease process is very gradual. And the more distal you are, the more acute are the symptoms when they go, when they go bad. Uh, dialysis axis, uh, vascular dialysis axis, steel syndrome is a very classic finding is you, we have a waveform which is flat on, on the pulse waveform on the finger. And with the fistula compression, it starts, you know, the, the, the amplitude increases. And more than 50% of increase is significant so with the fistula compression. That's how it's diagnosed. Uh, a nice uh, duplex ultrasound will also give you good clues. So when you see an arterial waveform proximal to the fistula, it's not the standard triphasic waveform because the outflow resistance is very low. So you'll have a lot of spectral widening that you see. And then the upstroke is not as, uh, not as high. Now, when you see the arterial waveform distal to the fistula, you see this below the baseline, which means there is reversal of flow. And then once you see the reversal of flow, this is the radial artery in the distal to the fistula. And now you see distal waveform with improvement of flow after compression of the fistula. So that's how the waveform completely changes. Now from retrograde flow, you're getting anti-grade flow after the fistula is compressed. That is significant. However, this is a significant ultrasound finding which can be reproduced on anyone. It doesn't mean that they have steel syndrome. Steel syndrome is also a com com you know, combination of symptoms and this exam. So if you order a steel study on a fistula, you might get this as a positive study, but it doesn't mean that they always have symptomatic steel. Just remember that. It's one thing in training we are always tuned to. A CT angiogram, like I said, gives you a better delineation of proximal disease, like this occlusion of this subclavian artery here. Uh, selective angiogram, this is, this is done from the previous talks, very nicely copy, cut pasted this artery in continuity. But uh, a selective angiogram will give you real time, will give you all the collateral flow, It'll, it can be diagnostic as well as therapeutic at the same time. You can inject vasodilators, if there is spasm, you can go after, after a clot if there is, um, if there is an embolus, etc. Obviously if you have um, magnification and you look at the digital arteries carefully, here you see the ulnar artery comes in and then the palmar arch is interrupted and then you have a lot of small vessels going to the fingers, clearly not inline flow. Um, provocative maneuvers like reactive hyperemia, you can give vasodilators, you can, I don't know which operating room has, well, I guess you can bring the transplant set in and put the hand in cold water for 20 seconds, reduce the flow, etc. So th those are all indirect clues that tells you that is it spastic disease, is it temperature induced, or is it real time uh, <coughs> disease in them? Again, various angiograms with vasodilators can give you a dramatic improvement sometimes if it is only spasm. But remember one thing I was taught in training is spasm is usually spelled C-L-O-T. So don't, be, don't, don't, don't come out of the operating room and say, oh, that was spasm. So it has to be real spasm. It could be more often than not, it's clot. So don't deceive yourself. Occlusive lesions, um, catheter-directed thrombolysis versus surgical thromboembolectomy for embolic disease, and always, almost everyone goes on anticoagulation, pre and post, of course. Uh, percutaneous revascularization or a surgical bypass for larger occlusive lesions, more proximal lesions. Uh, distal occlusive lesions usually do better with surgical bypasses than endovascular treatment because the, the artery is so small, you need a good inflow, and if you don't have that, that artery is going to not survive much. Um, autogenous vein versus prosthetic. Typically, prosthetics do really bad in this area because of outflow resistance. So they, they usually fail much much more than than um, uh, vein. So you see some. This is thromboembolism from you know, just before the vertebral takeoff, after the vertebral takeoff into the arm, which has been lysed, and then here the clot has been pushed forward. And so, you know, the attempt on over the wire Fogarty, you can be successful. Of course, here I don't think they would attempt that because of embolism risk into the vertebral. But there was uh, the clot that goes distally, and then they had to go retrieve that. But every time you do a thrombectomy or an embolectomy percutaneously, always remember to go down the extremity, either upper or lower, to make sure you don't trash something down. <coughs> 
the embolectomy and acute embolectomy can be done usually at the brachial artery bifurcation. That's the commonest way to expose them, provided you have normal arteries, that is. And then do a longitudinal or a transverse arteriotomy depending on the size of the artery. More often than not, you need a longitudinal one because the artery is too tiny to put back together. And then a patch closure versus primary closure if it is longitudinal versus transverse. And then anticoagulation is a must for them. Uh, this is the patch closure and this is the amount of clot that came out. Again, this is just dramatic effect. Okay, so large vessel recal revascularization, many options, you know, endo endovascular options of stenting or open option for a carotid subclavian bypass, especially for this is the left side uh, with um, subclavian vessel disease. You see here, this is usually a balloon expandable stent that's placed here for precision. You don't want to go forward into the, across the vertebral, you don't want to come down towards into the, too much into the aorta. Uh, the carotid subclavian bypass is not done very often nowadays. I mean, I mean, we did that a lot in training, but I mean, I have not seen too many, except for concomitant with TVARs that we do them sometimes, selectively, of course. Uh, aneurysms of these arteries are not very common, but uh, typically they have digital pain or ischemia, and they have compressive symptoms higher up. So like a thoracic outlet syndrome, uh, usually a pulsatile supraclavicular or an infraclavicular mass will give you a clue. Uh, Non-invasive studies will show you the aneurysm. Sometimes it's hard to see behind the clavicle. Uh, that is a limitation, but usually the cross-sectional imaging is critical and very informative in these cases. Uh, the, con the aneurysm here is, this is an old picture, but the aneurysm of the subclavian artery, and there is a distal embolization to the brachial and into the ulnar which uh, had needed open surgery. The ways to tackle them are if you have an aneurysm, which is a fusiform aneurysm, which is more than two and a half centimeters, then typically you need an interposition graft. Uh, vein graft versus PTFE have the same outcomes in this area. Unless there is open trauma and there is an open wound here, then consider you know, doing only vein and not prosthetic if you can. Uh, typically the cervical rib, this is because of the cervical rib, so the cervical rib was taken off, and this is a, a PTFE graft actually, or a vein graft, whichever. Both are equally good. If you have a large aneurysm, which is like saccular this way, sometimes it's easier to just resect the whole thing and do an end-to-end -end primary anastomosis. It just depends on how much vessel you can mobilize and how much vessel you, you're gonna lose there. But of course, if you don't have any interposition or, or a graft, then it's good. Uh, exclusion of these vessels with stent grafts is also done. The only thing is the subclavian has a tremendous amount of vessels coming from it. Especially here, I guess this is one area just before the takeoff of the vertebral. The vertebral should come off here somewhere. And then the rema, in this case, the right internal mammary should come off there. If you don't have any branches between here and the takeoff of the subclavian, it may be safe enough to do a stent graft. But you want to make sure you don't knock off collateral flow coming from the subclavian and you don't jail the origin of the carotid out on the right side specifically. Other uh, rare conditions of Takayasu's and that sort is it's a system systemic inflammatory large vessel vasculitis, 80% female population, usually, they're usually young and they come with uh, they come with variety of symptoms. They're, they don't necessarily come with acute ischemia but the syncopal attacks, claudication in the arm, and then they have multiple problems, you know, segmental stenosis, occlusions, aneurysmal degeneration. Always make sure we study the aorta because there are various types of uh, takayasus. The key things are, you know, remember, recognize the pattern, look for the pattern, look for other associated vessel involvement, uh, look at their ESR, look at the CRP, and the reason for that is the treatment is usually medical in the beginning. Let them cool off. That is the key. Don't operate on someone with acute symptoms or acute in inflammatory condition. Angioplasty has extremely limited role in takayasus, uh, almost virtually going to fail. And so arterial reconstruction is the, is the order of the day. That is mostly required. Uh, distal anastomosis, make sure that's free of any inflammatory involvement. And again, let them cool off and then do this. Uh, giant cell arthritis, commonly we get called for temporal artery biopsy for, the di for this diagnosis. Uh, it's more common than, than Takayasu. It affects the more elderly population. There is pan arteritis of medium to large size arteries. Uh, average onset is, like I said, older cop population, twice as much in women as men. Again, you know, steroids is the treatment of choice. Uh, 
operation, op you rarely require operative intervention, but uh, for chronic occlusive complications, you should get that. And the, the diagnosis of this is usually by a temporal artery biopsy that we get called for. Always remember, take about three or four centimeters of the artery. Don't go down with the bovie, sharp and blunt dissection, and then <clears throat> once you excise it, then get control of your bleeding. Typically, it's not too much of a problem. This is, I think, we found this when the hospital is now moving to the new tower and the main building has been, you know, excavated. This is an old diagram, I think from the 1960s somewhere. One of Dr. DeBakey's old uh, arteriograms, I think. Um, Non-occlusive ischemia is, um, <clears throat> usually treatment is all medical. You know, stop the causative agent, that's the first thing. And then give them calcium channel blockers, um, like nifedipine, uh, vasodilators like nitroglycerin or papaverin, pr prostaglandins, et cetera, et cetera. Essentially medical treatment. Uh, and interesting, the, the sexy ones are the hypothenar hammer syndrome. This comes in the exam actually sometimes, where a welder or a, or a guy who uses his hand to, you know, a carpenter or something of that sort. So this is a very classic uh, finding of hypothenar hammer syndrome where there's an aneurysm actually of the, of the uh, ulnar artery. And uh, the important thing to re remember is always get a hand surgeon with you if you're going to dive into this, because there is an extremely complex anatomy, especially the nerve that goes along um, the ulnar artery. And you can get insensate hand <coughs> here, or you can lose motor function to the, to the lumbricals on this side. Uh, usually the revascularization is done with dorsal foot vein, like the early saphenous vein, uh, and usually it's a vein graft. One quiz is, what is this? Huh? How do you know? Okay, well, you came to that, but that was my thing is the diagnosis is in his pocket. So he has a pack of smokes with him in the wheelchair with all four extremities gone. So it's uh, thromboangitis obliterans. It's, uh, you, all, you all know this, uh, it's usually intermediate to small arteries. Uh, flattened waveforms are seen on the digits, and then the angiography shows you abrupt occlusions with like corkscrew collaterals going down. Uh, typically, it's all non-operative management. It's initially with education, smoking sensation, so, uh, try pharmacologic therapy because really revascularization is very poor, uh, and then wound care. And then operative management is don't dive into this quickly. First, stop the smoking, and then otherwise you're doomed to fail for sure. And then uh, a surgical bypass, they're not great uh, success because the outflow arteries are extremely tragically, sadly gone. And amputation is usually the end point on these ones. Uh, the digit ulcers with burger disease, usually good local wound care is important. Uh, debride the necrotic tissue, but try and see if you can improve inflow into that hand. Um, and with upper extremity, usually you should delay amputation unless you have a severe infection. Uh, so the diagnosis is based on history and exam mainly, and it's confirmed with non-invasive testing. You should get invasive testing, to, especially for distal problems. Uh, revascularization for large vessel disease is usually good. You have good results with long-term patency. And then you should give supportive treatment for vasospastic and small vessel disease. And we thank you. <laughs>